Good morning. I'm continuing with the uh, atomic structure, the atomic buildup, and we're going to uh, see the way the periodic table works out. Uh, a lot of this stuff you don't really need for chemistry. Really, I want to just teach you guys how to write chemical formula, name chemical compounds, write equations for chemical reactions, and balance the equations. This stuff you don't really need for that, but it's traditionally taught with it anyway. Um, basically, the information behind the buildup of all the elements in the periodic table up to 92, beyond 92 they're not naturally occurring. Hydrogen, number one. Helium, number two. Lithium, number three. Beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, etc. and it will end them all up to 92 uranium. Now, up till about silicon, First of all, in the nucleus we have protons and neutrons. Most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. The electrons are tiny little things and you don't even bother counting them in the mass. So the atomic weight consists of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons because they're about the same. They're the same in atomic mass. Each proton or neutron is said to be one atomic mass unit. So if you have carbon, atomic number is six. So it has six protons plus six neutrons. We write that as 12. The number upstairs in the atomic number denotes the place of that particular uh, atom in the atomic buildup, in the periodic table. Number six. 12 is the atomic weight. Did I say that the wrong way around? Now, if we have six protons, they can hang on to six electrons as well to make a neutral atom. Six positive charges for the protons, six negative charges for the electrons makes a neutral atom. Okay? If you take an electron away, the atom is going to be heavy on the positive side. You're going to have six pluses, but only five minuses. So a net charge of positive one would exist on an atom if you took away one electron. That's said to be ionized, okay? You ionize an atom, put, make it an ion, either positive or negative. Okay, let's not talk too much about that. So let's see, uh, what else can I say about the atomic build? Oh yeah, people involved in the, this would be Niels Bohr, Arnold Sommerfeld, because it's the Bohr-Sommerfeld model of the atom that basically we're starting to look at first. Now, the idea of more complicated electronic structures comes out of quantum mechanics, the wave model, due to Schrodinger and some other people. Okay, so other people involved here would be Wolfgang Pauli, Pauli's exclusion principle. It says that no two electrons can have the exact same set of quantum numbers, or no two electrons could be in the same state at the same time, same place if you like. So what else can we say? That's it. Now let's look at the nucleus. All the protons and nuclear neutrons are in there, and outside are places where we can put electrons. Orbits, if you like. We're going to call them old-fashioned notation K, L, M, and N shells, right? We don't need to go up too high. Now, at most, in the first shell, we can put two electrons in there. Now, two electrons, why? Because one is spinning one way and one is spinning the other way. Electrons have a thing called spin. It's uh, an intrinsic thing to do with electrons, whatever that means. Physicists use that all the time. Spin is something not quite fully understood, but it's a degree of freedom that an electron has. So two electrons can go in the first shell. That means Pauli's exclusion principle is satisfied because one electron is spinning one way and one is spinning the other way. They don't have the exact same set of quantum numbers. Eight electrons can fit into the L shell. Eighteen at most can fill in the M shell, and thirty-two electrons in the N shell. Okay, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Now if we look closely at these shells, we see that there's structure in there as well. Okay? It's not just a simple orbit. So let's look at now what are, what are called orbitals. 
I'm only going to do the basics because you don't really need this for chemistry. For chemistry, we need one piece of information. We have eight electrons outside an atom, and the outer uh, valence electrons, that's what they're called. They're the ones that take part in chemical reactions. And eight is a stable number. That means eight is also stable here, and eight is stable here. We look at the kind of configuration that this, this represents. So let's have a look at the structure now more closely. <clears throat> so this is electron configuration, if you like. to look at two types of uh, configurations. Now, if I start off in the K-shell, we have what's called an S-orbital. And the S orbital is a spherical shape. It's actually a solution to what's called Schrodinger's equation. It describes this shape. S orbital is spherical and contains at most two electrons. So we can put one electron one spin up and another electron one spin down, and that, uh, that would be full. Now in the L shell, this is the first shell, this is the second shell, this is the third shell. You can call them energy levels if you want comes from Bohr's quantization condition. And you can look at my les lesson on that if you want to. So in the second shell, we can also have an S orbital. I didn't do this right. I'll do it this way. It's an S orbital. In the second shell, L shell, we can have also two electrons in there. Now, in the L shell, or the second orbital, we also have three p orbitals. And we can put one electron in there, one electron in there, and one electron in there. And we use Hun's rule. That means we put one in here first, one in there, and then one there, and then we start going back, filling up these shells. Now let's see what atom we would have got at. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Stable configuration. That would be neon. Let's look at what the p orbitals are like. Well, we can have six electrons in the p orbitals, in the px, the py, and the pz, right? What does that mean? Well, px, it's a dumbbell shape along the x-axis. And py, along the y-axis. And if we had an axis in or out of the page, in other words, coming in, I can't draw it, but the pz, orbital will be coming out of the page. So we have one in each degree of freedom. And two electrons can at most fit into those. Now let's go to the M shell. I'm not going to split this one up into parts, but once we go past the P, we end up with a D orbital. And it's complicated. Let's fill in electrons for this particular case. 
Well, we can have one, two electrons in an s orbital in the third or the m shell. We can have electrons going into the p orbital. And we fill it up. And let's see what element that would be. Well, this one up to here was neon. Aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. Now I've, I've lost track. What comes after chlorine? Uh, just count them. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So whatever is atomic number 18, let me check. Argon. Actually, of course, I should have known it because this is a stable. This is the next noble gas. Argon, yes. Argon is number 18. But suppose we want to go higher than argon. Number 19. Atomic number 19. Number 20. 21. 22. 23. 23 electrons, 23 protons. That's number vanadium, okay? Now we go beyond vanadium. Start filling it up. Like Hun's rule, this people fill up the seats of a bus that are empty first. Now let's count all those. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 14, 6, 28. Number 28 is nickel. So this would be nickel. Now there's a conventional way to write this. So we say the electron configuration for nickel is as follows. In the first shell, in an s orbital, we can have two electrons. In the second shell, the second shell, in the s orbital, we can have two electrons. And in the second shell, in a p orbital, we can have six electrons. This is the conventional way to write this down. Now in the third shell, in the next level, sorry, we need to write that down as third shell. 3s, we can have 2. 3p, 6. And 3d, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons. And that's the way we get it. Get it. 2, 8. 2 and 6 is 8, and 10 is 18. And that's what I said, the total number of electrons in each shell. Now you can just keep on going if you want to, look it up in the book, but this is the pattern. You could go to the fourth shell and label it 4SPD and add in another kind of an orbital called an F orbital. And then that would account for 32 electrons if it was filled. Now see what we're doing? We never have all the electrons. We couldn't have three electrons in, let's say, a 1S orbital. That would be disobeying Pauli's exclusion principle. Not only that, we fill them up like the seats, of a, seats in a bus, Hun's rule, okay, for filling them up. Now that's the electron configuration, and stab stability is had when we have the S shell full and the P shell full. Sorry, P orbitals. That's stability. And compounds work like this. All the time, atoms are coming together to achieve this magic number of eight. Okay? That's the way the atomic buildup works. Now, our next lesson is going to deal with compounds. How do we get them? So we start now. Now, in our periodic table, really the only elements that take part in compounds are as follows. I'm trying to remember. If we take two or more non-metals, we get a molecule, right? we get a covalent bond. Electrons are shared. An 
an example would be water. Now hydrogen has one electron in the outside shell and a space. A space where there is no electron. We'll denote that as an X. Okay? We'll also denote it like this. It has one possible electron that can take part in making a bond. So let's see what oxygen looks like. Oxygen has two, four, five, six electrons in the outside shell. So the electron configuration for oxygen, because oxygen is atomic number eight, two, four, and four is eight. Two electrons in the first shell, and six in the K shell, L shell. There are space. There's a space for two electrons in there. So I denote that by that. It would be full if that had eight electrons, okay? And that would be, I guess, neon. So there's a space here. So I can come along with a hydrogen atom. We can put our space like this. I'll take this hydrogen atom and put it here. So what happens? That electron from oxygen goes into the hydrogen slot. And this electron from hydrogen goes into the oxygen slot. Wait a minute, I could put another H over here. Oh, who's that? Now we have a bond. This is a covalent bond. Now the, el el the element that forms the most number of covalent bonds is the element carbon. And that's why we have life on this planet. Organic chemistry, I have a lesson with organic chemistry that you guys should look up, really involves the covalent compounds of carbon. Now silicon has the same electron configuration as carbon. Star Trek, the original Star Trek in the 60s, uh, they had a program whereby they went on this planet and the planet, the basis of life on that planet was silicon. But the problem is silicon does not make strong covalent compounds or bonds, so it has less of a choice. Carbon can make big long chains of molecules, such as the DNA and so on and so forth. Alkanes. Alkanes are um, paraffins and, uh, let's see, I'll do, I'll do, you have to check the... Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write the oxygen symbol and the H symbol, and there's a H symbol. Rather than doing four dots all the time, what we have here is... H2O, one, two, two oxygens of hydrogen and one, uh, one oxygen and two hydrogens, H2O, covalent bond. And it happens, covalent compounds happens when we take non-metals and non-metals. Now what if we take two metals? A metallic bond, not very interesting. We're going to leave them out. But there is a kind of a bond that happens between a metal and a non-metal. Now remember I said most of the elements in the periodic table are metals. So the rest that involve themselves in the reactions are the non-metals. Let's list them. All the various different compounds that are covalent bonds arise from the following. Hydrogen, not helium because it's an inert gas. Nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, bromine, fluorine, um, iodine. What else? Sulfur. And that's about it. Silicon, maybe. So they're the non-metals that take part in most of the bonds. But we can also have groups of these that behave as a unit. We'll talk about those later. So they make all the covalent bonds. Covalent compounds, if you like, such as uh, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride. These are acids. Hydrofluoric acid, hydrofluoric acid. I forgot carbon. Carbon also. CO2, carbon dioxide. 
nitric oxide. Nitrous oxide, I can't remember if it's this or us. NO2, there's also NO3. NH3 is ammonia. So there are the covalent bonds. Now, if we have a metal, and one of these guys, we get a salt. And it's an ionic bond. Okay? A common salt is the metal sodium combined with chlorine. Sodium chloride. And you see the pattern for naming these things. You take the name of the metal, take the name of the non-metal, and add IDE. They're all like that. Potassium bromide, sodium bromide, magnesium chloride, magnesium oxide, iron oxide, iron oxide is rust, magnesium sulfide, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we'll look at these in more detail in the next class. So let's gather our thoughts. We talked about the electronic buildup, right? We have the K shell, the L shell, the M shell. Energy levels, one, two, and three, if you like. And you can put two, eight, 18, and 32 to fill up in each shell. Uh, the mass of the atom is in, mostly in the nucleus, and in there you have protons and neutrons. Uh, we can have two different types of compounds when these elements come together to make a neutral, atom, a neutral molecule or a neutral bond in the case of a salt. We can have metal plus non-metal ionic compounds or salts. We can have non-metal plus non-metal molecules. This is not a molecule, right? This will involve itself in what's called a crystal lattice because we'll get crystals when we have salts. And there's more to come.